we go. Let's start over. Good evening. <laughs> I'm telling you, are we not blessed, saints, not only to have the presence of the Lord here tonight. I'm thinking, Lord, you're looking favor on me tonight. I need your help. Yeah, I know. And boy, it is so good in here. I'm just, I'm just cooking, literally. I'm going like, Mm -hmm, barbecue time. I'm a cooking. It is so good to be here, but just to hear our pastor once again, we're talking about this month, spiritual warfare, warfare, and uh, honor. Honor, and one thing we've been honoring our pastors all month, and we're so blessed, but even once again to hear this man of God saying, let's support our community, our other churches in the community. Say, this is not normal. Am I the only one that this, this is not normal? We guess we've gotten so used to it being normal for us now, but this is not normal. Most church pastors do not want to share their congregation or get them. They want to keep them all to themselves and in fear that they may lose some. You know what I'm saying? But I thank God for this man of God and this woman of God that believed in me and my wife. And, and uh, something I did want to talk about in the very beginning here, we're talking tonight on the subject of i got to look at my notes here. How to defeat your depression and going like, Brother Rick, how's that got to do with spiritual warfare? Oh, believe me. Ever heard of discouragement? Discouragement leads to despair. Despair leads to depression. Come on, we all have gone through depression at times in our lives. But before I get into that stuff there, I want to just kind of uh, bring some honor and kind of share where I have been with our pastor and, and him believing in me, another pastor in the community where I was at. And, and uh, I recall very clearly back at Killin' and Grill, and I, I was thinking about it again today, and I'm thinking, if I did not come, where would I be today? If I didn't come to that Killin' and Grill event, and the reason why I say that for is this, I didn't want to come. It was the fifth one. I've been to every one of them, but I'm going, like, I don't want to go. I don't feel like going. I'm tired. Come on, anybody ever felt like that way? Then after you go and you went to church or you went to the, oh, I'm so glad I went. Well, I got to meet Pastor Rick that very first night. And, and to be honest with you, I always envisioned Pastor Rick Lopez as a short guy, black hair, you know, nice tan. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Would you please stand up? No, but uh, then I see this guy, <laughs> the other Lopez, then I see this gentleman, he, he has no hair. He's white like me. I'm going like, wow. You yeah, know, but uh, he, he said, hey, we need to connect. And something popped in my spirit. I'm going like, yeah, we need to connect. And uh, at that time, we was not having Wednesday night services at our church. And I said, honey, we need to go down to Res Life down there on Wednesday nights and invite our congregation out of the world thing. You know, I mean, it's not normal for you to go to somebody else's church on Wednesday night and invite your congregation. Come on, let's go up the road, you know, and let's, let's, let's congregate with them guys, you know, and not knowing that God had a plan. Come on. And I remember it was about the third, third Wednesday in, we were over in that room over there that night because they were working on this wonderful uh, worship display and they didn't want to expose it. And I knew that night that I couldn't take more. I was to the point of despair. As a pastor, I was to the point that I was ready to throw the towel in. I was ready just to go sit back in the chair and just sit back and relax. Because I'm telling you, saints, being a pastor is not easy. Oh, we make you look easy. Oh, one hour a week. Hey, they got it made. Sit back, drink their coffee, big B coffee. They've got it made, but saints, you don't believe the warfare that goes on. I mean, I was reminded as I was looking through some of my notes, and I just want to read a few things here. Just kind of give you a general idea. This is not even our pastor. Our pastor is a different breed. I mean that in a good way. I've never met a pastor, a man of God like this man of God, that this is even this, none of this even comes close to him. But this was me, many of the stuff in here that I want to share. Pastors, this is the statistics going on today. And why we honor our pastors. The reason why is this. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. 1,500. Yeah, it's oh, it's so sad. That I was going to be one of them. 4,000 new churches begin each year, but, only, but over 7,000 churches close. 80% of pastors and 84% of their spouses feel unqualified and discouraged in their role as pastors. Oh, dear God. 50% of pastors are so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, comma, but have no other way of making a living. 85% of pastors said that the greatest problem is that they're sick and tired of dealing with people's problems. <laughs> I kind of thought of Moses, you know, and Abraham going, like, Lord, you deal with them. I'm going to take them out, you know. <laughs> How about pastors' wives? A few things on here I thought was interesting. 85% of pastors' spouses feel their spouses overworked. 80% um, of pastors' wives feel left out and unappreciated by church members. 
How about 80% of pastor spouses wish their spouses would choose another profession? Mm. How about 8% of pastor's wives feel pressured to do things and, and be something in the church that they're really not? How about pastor's uh, children? 80% of, um, of adult children of pastors surveyed had to seek professional help for depression. Saints, there's a tool the devil likes to use. It's called the spirit of discouragement. If he can get your mind thinking about the things that are destructive, he's got you and he'll take you down a road and he will bring your own flock in and he will allow you, if you allow them to, they will continue to beat you and beat you until you're nothing but on the ground. I had been there. So for, so to the point of despair that I was, I never had depression so bad where it hurt. I would go to work at the church. My wife can identify to this. I'd come home a half hour later, crawl back into bed, crawl in a ball and just cry because I had no hope. I had no future. I was just literally discouraged, depressed, burned out. I could not take any more. But then God brought this man of God into my life. It was at that time in my life, about a year and a half ago, that I said, Pastor Rick, I want to take you out for breakfast. Okay, where do you want to go? And I said, let's go to Tim Hortons. Then I thought about Bigby and I got converted. But anyways, <laughs> within 15 minutes of meeting this man of God, I did not know him. He did not know me. I just knew that I needed a mentor and I knew that he was the one. And I remember asking him, I said, Pastor Rick, I need you. I need help. My wind and my sails is gone. I'm at, the, I'm at the end of my rope. I can't do anymore. And I said, you don't know me. I don't know you, but I know God has called you to me. And he kind of chuckled a bit and goes, what is God doing? You're the third pastor. Listen to me. You're the third pastor in the community has come to me for help. This is not normal. Our pastor is a different breed. There's not too many pastors that are out there that are going to help somebody else in their own community thrive. I tell you, we began at, at that first meeting we had. We got into the nitty-gritty. I mean, he began to ask me questions, ask me anything you want. I'm, I'm an open book. I'll tell you anything. Have you been reading the Bible? No, I kind of give it up. Just preaching the word. Have you been praying? No. Okay, we got to get back to the basics. And I, that's when Pastor Reboot. <laughs> Pastor Reboot began to happen. You ever heard of his marriage reboot? That is awesome. Believe me, I'm going through it now. But I began the Pastor Reboot process. And I began to reboot beautifully. And I know within about two weeks, I began to feel life come back into my being. And every week I'd bring, I'd bring two or three problems to him. And I'd say, like, how do you deal with this? And how do you do it? Man, I'm going like, wow answers and he was beginning to bring wind back to my sails and we're going to see tonight a man of God named Elijah in the Bible and this man of God was my Elijah and I was the Elisha there that he was coming alongside because I need a man of God I need a God to send somebody in my life to say you know what I need some help and this man humbled himself enough to say you know what Hey, we're in this together let's work together how many pastors in the communities do they meet together on Monday morning at River Rock in a bar, okay, they have breakfast. You know, this is not normal. But saints, we don't realize how blessed we are to have the man of God. I'm not here to lift him up, but I'm here to show honor. Because if it wasn't for this man of God, I would not be standing here today. I'd probably be back on the workforce, like the statistics here said. Just saying, you know what, and it's not worth it. But I'm telling you, when you get your eyes and your, and your mind where it belongs, whew, Wow, there were some things there, some key points that were turning in my head, going like, where was you 10 years ago? Where was you 8 years ago? I could have used you back then. But God's a God who's on time. Amen? He had a plan, and God said, I'm going to use all that stuff there so that you can help others. See, he's already been down that road. He's been seasoned for, what, 19, 20 years as a pastor? And he ain't what he is today because of this woman of God right here. Come on, I know that person because I was a pastor for almost eight years. It was for this woman of God here, I would not be, how many times I wanted to quit. I was down there writing my letter of resignation downstairs, because honey, you know you can't do that. But this is the woman of God saying, honey, are you sure you called the pastor at church? Yeah. <laughs> and how that all changed, but it's the women of God in our lives that kept on prodding me along and saying, you can do this. It's going to be all right. And we had other women in the church that were praying, interceding, and saying, don't give up, Pastor. Don't give to the enemy. But this is a real fight, saints. This is an invisible war that we cannot see, but it's so real. Yeah. Depression is a real thing. The devil wants to try to take you out. Even the more leadership. I'm telling you, we've got some tight leadership here. I'm telling you, we've got some teaching. Even this, saints, even hear me on Wednesday nights, how many pastors would give up their pulpit? Not me. 
every Wednesday night to let somebody else get their sword sharpened and, and continue on and to train them. How many pastors? This is not normal. I thank God. Because when I came down here, I'm going like, well, I guess I'm done preaching. I said, no, you're not. I'm still going to use you. And actually, I'm still growing. Never stop growing. Pastor, I thank you. Thank you for sowing into my life. You saved me from the despair. Sure, I had my ups and down days. We still have our talks. We still have, hey, and things are not perfect because I'm here at Resurrection Life Church. No, it's, I've got my issues. Hello, every church, okay. I have my things that I'm dealing with, but he's still here. I can still call upon him. Yep. If you have your Bibles here tonight, I love you too, Diane. Thank you so much. Like I said last week, he was not here. This is the woman that put me under the microscope at Applebee's when I, when I felt that God was calling us down here to join you guys in uh she does not allow anybody to come in the house of God without going through some ritual, uh, mm -hmm, you know, but it was all good. I'm going like, boy, she had questions I never thought of she was going to ask. But, uh, and I thank God. I really do. I thank God that uh, we're here and we love you guys and we're just getting to know everybody in the name situation, you know, get to work with me on this yet, okay, you know. <laughs> it's still coming along, but I'm working on it. So the issue with depression, let's talk about this for a second. It's kind of a depressing thing to talk about depression, but it's something that is real that each one of us at times in our life we deal with, that I have dealt with, that I, I mean, sometimes it's, it's very light, other times it's pretty deep. But I really want us to look at here, a man of God. In the Bible, like I said a moment ago, and his name is Elijah. If you have your Bible, as you can open with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be looking uh, through um, verses 1 through 15. Now, if you don't have your Bibles, I have the scriptures on the outline, on the, on the screen. But I also have in your outlines, if you don't have an outline, I have one left, and it's going for five hours, okay? No, just kidding. But if you want this one last outline, I know we ran out, but if anybody wants this quickly, going once, going twice, okay, there we go. There we go. I hate to see you go to waste. Thank you. There you go. Awesome. There's no test afterwards. I say that every time. Everybody relax. It's okay. Take them home, and hopefully we get through it. Oh, we got plenty of time. Wonderful. Praise God. Depression is the number one health problem in America today. It is, in the, um, it is called the, the common cold of emotional illness. You know, when my aunt came here from California, she stepped foot on the ground here a couple of years ago, and she goes, Ricky, there's a heaviness here. There's such a heaviness of depression. There's a heaviness of discouragement here. And I said, it is just so strong. And I said, really? Because you're living here, you don't recognize it. But for me, from another area, there is a spiritual heaviness here. And I'm going like, wow. And I got thinking about all the job closings and the, and the, the factories and the, the car problems and all these things happening in Michigan. I said, well, that does make sense. That wonder why people are not discouraged and, and feeling like they're down and out. But there's a guy in the Bible, you know, there's even leaders in the Bible that got depressed. Yeah. And I'm talking about here tonight about Elijah. Elijah was a tremendous spokesman for God. He was a spokesman for God. For years, he had been God's mouthpiece uh, for the nation of Israel, and all kinds of miracles had taken place. He was rocking and rolling, he was making progress, and he was doing great things for the kingdom of God. But it all came to a screeching halt when one person, listen to me say, it's just one person didn't like him. Her name was Jezebel. She didn't like him. And he took it personal. He took it personal. And it's kind of crazy, but this is how the devil works. He likes it, makes you take things personal. It's like, oh, he got offended. He got hurt. So he, said he took off into the desert. But she was, this, this Jezebel woman, she was a very wicked woman. If you did not know anything about her, she was very wicked. She was a very evil person. You have heard her name before, and we don't like to speak it because of the fact that she is so evil. But after a great miracle had happened with Elijah in the Bible, in the previous chapter, um, Ahab come to Jezebel in verse 1 and says this, that Ahab told Jezebel, <laughs> I just want to slap him, everything that Elijah had done. Mm. Just get the fire going. That made her very mad. Why? Because no longer the focus on her, but the focus was on Elijah. 
Okay, so it goes on here to verse 2. It says this, that Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods, that's a little g, okay, the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. What is she saying there? She had all the prophets killed. All the prophets of God killed. It's in other words, she said, you know what, Elijah, if you're not dead by this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill myself because I can't take it anymore. She was ready to say, enough's enough. But here's Elijah, who had been fearless for years. And one woman threatens his life, and he becomes frightened. He turns and runs to the edge of the desert. Anybody ever felt like running? <laughs> Dear God, you know, many times... I've called my wife with a cell phone. I'm out of here, dear. Goodbye. I'm leaving. I'll send you my address. We'll meet up later because I can't take it anymore. <laughs> Seriously, saints. When ministry gets to be too much. <sighs> you know how many times that I was on my way down to, I said, I'm heading to Aunt Nana's, and that's down in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be down there about nine hours. I can't take much more. We're talking on the phone, and back to St. John's, I'm traveling back because my wife has kind of got me calmed down. Don't let this one person, this one person get under your skin. It's going to be all right, dear. Oh, I felt like an Elijah sometimes. And in verse 3, it says this. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went for a day's journey into the desert. And he came to a broom tree, and he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. Let's pause right there. How many have ever been there? Lord, just take me now, because <laughs> I can't take much more. Lord, just take me now. And I heard my grandfather say that when he was on his, pretty much on his deathbed. Go, Lord, just take me now. I said, Grandpa, what are you talking about? He goes, I don't want to be a burden anymore to anybody. And I'm going like, Grandfather, what are you saying? God, he didn't mean that. <laughs> Grandpa, you're staying here. <laughs> We're not done with you. He was such a godly influence in my life. But there's times when it's kind of get to the point, it's like, enough's enough. He was depressed, and he goes on to say that, I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. See, Elijah was a prime candidate for the big D, for depression. Yeah. A big candidate. See, he was physically tired. He was emotionally exhausted. All right? And somebody had threatened his life, so he was a prime, a, a prime candidate for to be an emotional fruit basket at this point. And what was he dealing with is really the issue of fear. We know that fear was involved, resentment. There was some guilt. Oh, God, I failed God here, and now I've made a mistake, and I'm, I'm running off my tail between my legs. There was anger he was dealing with, weariness and worry. All six of those things were just covered in that tax. Things that Elijah was dealing with. But the interesting thing about this book is this. In the book of James, it says this, that Elijah was a man just like who? Us. Wow. You mean Elijah was a man just like, uh, yeah. That, in other words, he, we can understand what Elijah is going through because Elijah was just a human being. Even though he was used by God, he was still just like us. Wow. See, why do people get themselves into such a mess? Why do we do that for? Why do I do that for, Lord? Why is that for? See, obviously he was so depressed, he was ready to kick the bucket. And I'm not talking about KFC either. <laughs> Now, Joni probably, yeah, that's a no-no, right? Yeah. No, you're good with KFC? Oh, wonderful. No fast food. So why do we get ourselves in such an emotional mess? The answer is this, saints. It's faulty thinking. We get short-circuited up here. Remember, saints, the battlefield of the mind. This is where the battle takes place. It's, it's bad thoughts, it's negative thoughts, it's thoughts we entertain that put us in that, in that place that we should not be. We, we begin to play with those thoughts and begin to, hmm, yeah, you know, I'm feeling pretty bad today, and yeah, things are going my way, so what are we going to, and you start getting depressed. You start getting discouraged, and you start going like, yeah, you know, but the problem is your feelings lie. Ever thought about that? Your feelings do not always tell you the truth. Where one day when I was, a couple weeks after we were married, so my wife and I said, rolled over in bed. I said, honey, I don't feel like I'm married. She goes, too bad, buddy. Get up. You are married. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but there's times, there's days that I don't feel like I'm a Christian. Lord, I don't feel like I'm a Christian. Doesn't mean that I'm not. Your feelings lie to you. 
We begin to be, when we begin to be, um, when we begin to believe those feelings, it's called stinking thinking. But also the Bible says this: it says, "As a man thinketh, so is he." So as a man thinketh, so is. He. So what did you hear this past Sunday? The, the, the children ministry did an awesome job. It's a process of what? Of renewing our minds, renewing our thinking. It's like, Lord, your word says, Lord, your word says, Lord, your word says. But the problem is, saints, let's be honest here, it's called spiritual laziness. What else could it be? We know what we got to do, but why do we not do it? Because we get spiritually lazy, we're just too tired. It's easier to sit there in the dark with the curtains closed, eating your bonbons and um, salted popcorn, and feeling having pity party for yourself. And I tell you right now, the, the angels aren't going to show up going, hallelujah. No, the devil's going to show up going like, oh yeah, let's pour it on. Let's just pour it on. Let's have a pity party for yourself because things are not going your way. Come on, I've been there, saints. Everybody likes to have, you know, feel sorry for themselves once in a while, so we have our own pity party. But Jesus says, when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Right. Shall set you free. Yes. See, if you look at the things at the right point of view, the right thoughts, the right point of view, you will not be depressed. You can be free from depression. Let's be honest with you just a moment here before I go into my points. So a few weeks ago, dealing with some depression, like depression, didn't really realize it as depression, but driving bus in the mornings, I spent about three hours on the road, your mind has time to think. And he is, the kids are sleeping, and, and I begin to get kind of discouraged. I knew what I had to do. So I was sitting in the parking lot out here. I, don't, I think it was coming in for prayer on Thursday. And I said to my wife, and I said, honey, I'm just getting so discouraged. I just could just easily just throw the towel in. I'm just so upset and discouraged. And, and as soon as I said that to her, she said, exactly to me, I was back to normal. I said, dear God. It was an attack of the enemy. And what was I doing? I was feeding the fire. I was feeding the fire. I'm going like, dear Jesus, thank you for rescuing me, but also just thank you for showing me that we was under attack. Saints, the devil does not go to sleep. All right? He's looking for opportunities to come in and play in your mind because this can become a playground for the enemy. We don't want that going on. We don't want that going on. So we're going to look at tonight, we're going to see, first of all, number one is this. Why we get depressed according to Elijah, and also number two, how God cured it. How did God cure Elijah? So the very first thing, if you're taking notes here tonight, why did Elijah get depressed? Elijah played, and we played the exact same four mental games, saints. Four mental games that he played. Number one is this. We focus on our feelings rather than the facts. It's exactly what Elijah did. It says here in verse 3, Elijah was afraid. He ran for his life. The result of it was this. He came to a broom tree. He sat under it. He prayed that he might die. What did he say? I've had enough. He's saying, God, I'm fed up. I don't want to do this anymore. I give up. These people will not change. I have been trying and trying and trying and trying. You know how frustrating it was for me many times that I'm preaching the word. I imagine pastor probably feel the same way and other people is like, I've been preaching this word for how long and I ain't seen no fruit in my people. It's like, you talk about discouraging. I'm preaching all these messages. I'm going like, what's wrong with these guys? It gets kind of discouraging. But you know what I realized? It's not up to me. It's up to them. I just got to do my job and they got to do theirs. And hey, oh, I got free. And that was a nugget from pastor. I'm going like, thank you. Where was you eight years ago? Where was you 10 years ago? You know, I mean, I'm, going, I'm, I'm doing all these messages, but I'm not seeing no change. Don't worry about it. Just do what you're called to do. Well, I can handle that. <laughs> but here's Elijah saying in the exact same way. I've been trying to work with your people, Lord, but they want to be stiff-necked and hard-headed and, and still worship these pagan gods and do their thing. And oh, I can relate to Elijah. His first mistake, the same mistake that we make when we get depressed is we focus on our feelings rather than the facts. See, that always happens when we're depressed. We focus on how we feel rather than the reality. See, Elijah felt like a failure because of the one little incident. He got afraid and he ran. Then he started condemning himself. Hello? I'm such a coward. Look at me. I'm out here in the desert. I've run away. How could God ever use me now? I made a mistake. <laughs> he felt like a failure, so he said, well, I must be a failure. Once again, your feelings lie. Yes, See, it's, it's, it's the idea that if a 
if I feel it, so it must be true. See, musicians and athletes and, and uh, TV show producers, all these people, when they've produced something, going like, wow, that didn't feel like it came out right. I mean, I could preach my worst message. You know, I'm going like, dear God, that came out so wrong. And I get more like, thank you. That was like, what are you talking about? I'll go home and I'll beat myself up and going like, dear God, help me with that. This raised that from their memories. That was awful, but our feelings lie. That's right. Our feelings lie. And I'm going like, so it took me some time to realize that. I'm going like, wait a minute. It's not about how well I performed. It's God's word. It's God's word that sets the people free. Right. See, there's times that I don't always feel close to God. It does not mean that God's not close to me. Once again, our feelings lie. You know, there's times when you, uh, you think that, well, I don't feel like a Christian. Like I said earlier, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. There's so many things how our feelings lie to us. Elijah thought, I feel so lousy, so I must be a loser. Not true. Here he said, I've had all these victories, and one little woman, one little woman scares me. What am I doing? What a failure I am. So I just must have made a mistake. So it doesn't mean that you're a total failure in life. Saints, we're allowed to make mistakes. Yeah, that's right. <sighs> Well, I guess I am sweating, aren't I? <laughs> you know, but you kind of think, wow, what a relief because there's times we, we do make mistakes. But God's not going to hold it over your head. Well, that's one mark. That's two marks. Three strikes, you're out. Back off the pulpit. No, that's not our God. Our God is not that way. That's a misconception. Everybody's entitled to make mistakes. The second thing is this. We compare ourselves to others. What did Elijah do, saints? Write that down. Number two, we compare ourselves to others. Comparing game, saints, is a naughty game. Hmm. It's not fair. And I recall one time that in my, uh, when I was working at a, a company and, and the gentleman walked, my boss walked up to me and he said, what is your problem, Rogers? I was a crew leader at the time. And he goes, so-and-so who ran this line could get big time numbers. And, and here you're not meeting that quota. And I'm going like, really? Do I have his crew? You know, am I doing the easy runs that he had? No, I've got the four-piece top, and he had the... And I'm always going through my mind. I'm going like, I'm sorry. I'm doing the best with what I have. And that gentleman found out who was working in other departments, wouldn't question about it. I said, that was very unprofessional and not fair to Rick. He came back the next day and apologized to me, and I said, thank you. Because that's not fair. It's not fair to compare. As a pastor, it was so easy for me to compare other churches in the community going like, based on our success, we're going like, gee, we can't get past 40. <laughs> you know, what's my problem, Lord? You know, and begin to compare other church. You can't do that because you start to compare. It causes you to get discouraged. Yeah. Throw the towel in. Here's what Elijah's doing. He's comparing himself. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. Mm, wrong. You not compare yourself. It'd be like me trying to compare myself to my grandfather. I mean, those to me are some big steps, um, some big shoes. I want to say that. <laughs> you know, some big shoes to fill. Right. There's no way. I can only be who I am called to be. I can't be anybody else. So it would be like my, my parents saying, why can't you be more like, you know, so-and-so, more like so-and-so, or why can't you preach like Billy Graham? Why can't you be like Pastor Rick? I mean, this guy, no, I can't be. I can only be me. Right. <sighs> what a relief. What a relief. And this is where the problem with Elijah is, saints. He's comparing himself to his, his ancestors. See, the first mistake to make in depression is we focus on our feelings and not the facts. The second mistake is when we make, uh, when, uh, we make in depression, we compare ourselves to others. If I could only be like so-and-so, I'll be okay. doesn't work, saints. It doesn't work. Quickly here in your notes, I, I wrote down three depressing mistakes that we make, and I wrote them in there for you for the sake of room <laughs> because I had a few notes on there. And, but we fall into these three traps, saints. The first one is this. We always compare our weaknesses to other people's strengths. Forgetting that those people might also have weaknesses that you don't have. I was just talking to a brother of mine here a few weeks ago, and, and, uh, and we were talking about some things in the ministry, and I said, no, 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 don't stop that, what you're doing, because you're good. I'm actually envious of how you do that, because there's no way that I can do that. And that's one of his strengths, but one of my weaknesses. No, I could focus on that going like, shh. I don't, I don't qualify to be a, you know, up here. I need to be down here with the rest of everybody else because I don't scan. No, you can't do that. You cannot compare yourself to somebody else because it's going to cause you to become depressed and discouraged. Because I can guarantee that person has weaknesses where I have strengths. Right. Number two, we try to motivate ourselves through criticism and condemnation. We do the shoulda game. Well, I should have did this and I should have done that and I should have. Saints, it doesn't work. It does. Are you with me tonight still? 
It's kind of like whipping yourself to motivate yourself. Don't do it, saints. It's a trap. It's a trap of the enemy. See, how many of you feel motivated at many times when I, I tell you that, you know, we should be out ministering to, witnessing about Jesus every day? Well, yeah, we should be. But is it motivation to do it? No. We know we should, but we don't do it. The should us. Don't get involved in that game. Nagging doesn't work. And three, we label ourselves. Don't get in that trap, saints. We always do that when we get depressed. We label ourselves. Instead of saying, well, I made a mistake, I say, well, I'm, I'm a total failure. Hello? You ever heard yourself saying that? Instead of saying, I actually tripped, I'd say, oh, I'm just a klutz. Or, I ate too much. No, actually, I'm a pig. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We begin to label ourselves by cutting ourselves down, thinking that's going to motivate ourselves to change. Saints, that's not the answer. It's not. Elijah said, I am no better than my ancestors. He was comparing himself, and that made him more depressed. Number three. We blame ourselves for negative events that aren't our fault, or I should say that are not our fault. We blame ourselves for negative events that are not our fault. Here's a lesson from Elijah once again. It says in verse 10, Lord, I have been very zealous for, for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars, and they put your prophets to death with the sword. He said, I have worked my tail off, and I ain't getting anywhere. I ain't getting anywhere for three years, and I'm not any closer to God than I was before, and I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. I've been zealous, but what do they do? What do, they do? They're still living the exact same way. Oh, Elijah, I feel for you. <laughs> oh, brother. In his depression, Elijah blamed himself for failing, for failing to change the nation. Saints, that was not his responsibility. He had to do what God called him to do. You can't change anybody. You can only change yourself. More breathing time. Yes. I can't change anybody. I can only change myself. Even though I like to change our spouse, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> See, anytime you help people, you sooner or later are going to realize that people do not always respond the way you like them to. You ever found that out? Your children, your friends, your coworkers. Your wife, people that you work with, people who, you work, who work for you, people just do not respond the way that you want them to. You can assume, you can't assume responsibility for that, saints. You know, I mean, even uh, here, you know, I've had some, uh, a gentleman walk up to me and I said, what do you do with a situation like that? He said, all you can do is encourage them. I'm going like, wow. I can breathe again. You know what I'm saying? There's always something, say, it's like you get, you get one plane land, there's another one waiting to come in. You know what I'm saying? And it can get kind of discouraging if you don't deal with those things as they come along. But the problem is we hang on to those things and begin to build and build and build. And actually, you know, the weight becomes so heavy that we're going like, I can't take it anymore. The weight is too heavy. Don't do it, saints. We're going to talk about how to get rid of that here in a second. The fourth mistake that we make is the second part of verse 10c, and it's this. We exaggerate the negative. We exaggerate the negative. I'm only the one, only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Who's they? There is nobody out there but one person that wants to try to take Elijah's life. And she's just running her mouth. I mean, she's just a blah, 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 blah. Oh, poor me. Elijah's having a pity party for himself. They're all after me. They want to take my life. The fact was, there's only one person that was against him. See, there's only one person, one woman that made the threat. And it was an empty threat. If she was, but she was smart, saints. Let's think about this for a moment here. If I had a hit out for somebody, if I was Jezebel, I would not send a messenger, I would send a hitman. <laughs> but she knew that she, if she was to kill um, Elijah to get rid of him, then there could be a problem. But she knows if she can get him to run like a coward and run for the desert, then he's going to look like a fool. And then she's going to have all the, the respect again that she's looking for. But she was smart. She was, but can I tell you something? Even the devil knows how to play those games. He uses people to get at us. He's it's the same way that God uses us to help people. The devil wants to try to use people to get against us also. There's a war going on. In verse 2, Jezebel sent a message saying, tomorrow I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah. Empty threats, saints. The devil doesn't have no teeth. Think that's funny? 
That is Canaan, my spirit. The devil does not have no teeth. He could go around roaring like a lion, making all these th threats, but he can't bite you. Only if you let him. Joni, if you don't straighten up, I have to put you to the back. <laughs> you know, the thing about it is, in chapter 18, if you've read the story, Elijah's a hero, and then chapter 19, Elijah's zero. Ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? One minute, he's like, oh, praise God, and the next week, I'm like, oh, dear God. But he didn't look at it that way. Why? Because when, when you're depressed, you always exaggerate the negative. Do we not? We think of the, the, always the worst case scenario. And it's like, hey, I'm just better off not being here. I'm, they're better off without me. And we begin to have all these negative thoughts and going like, oh, Lord. You know, I heard of a, a guy at a grocery store. He was a, an old wino hanging around the store. And one day he uh, fell asleep. So they stuck some Limburger cheese under his nose. He woke up and he goes, this store stinks. Walks outside, walking around, goes, the whole world stinks. The fact was, <laughs> the whole world doesn't stink, but that was his perception because he had Limburger cheese under his nose, which really does stink. But the same thing is true that, <laughs> so we do when we're depressed. Everything stinks. The whole world's going down and everything is, oh, please. Been there. The fact is, Elijah wasn't the only one. In verse 18, he said, God says, look, look, I have 7,000 prophets who still haven't given, have still not bowed down to the other's it's the emergency prayer line. I'm on call. <laughs> okay, I'm going to... All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm on call. I can't help it. All right. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Do -do -do. So quick review here. We're going to move on here quickly. These last four points we're going to move very quickly on. The first thing we talked about was this. We focus on, we focus on our feelings, not the facts. Bingo, we can't be doing that. Number two, we blame ourselves for things that are not our fault. All right, number three, we compare ourselves to others. And number four, we uh, exaggerate the negative. So what is God's remedy for Elijah's depression? What is it here? There's things that, these are the exact same remedies for us here today. The very first thing that I want you to write down if you're taking notes is this, is take care of your physical needs. We're gonna see here this morning, or excuse me, this evening, how we can defeat depression. God's way. I like hearing the verses 5 through 8a. It says this, Then Elijah lay down under the tree, and he fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there was, and by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and he drank, and he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat. The journey is too much, is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank and his strength and he was strengthened by the food. See, God's remedy for Elijah's depression was what? Rest, food, and relaxation. Saying sometimes all we need is a good night rest. Sometimes we just get in the camper and take off and get away from things and get, get away with God. That's what I did. When I got into depression, I had a good, um, a, a, a family in our church had a cabin up in Harrison. I got away, took my Bible, and I just put the earbuds on, and I got in the Word. By the third day, I was so strong, I was ready to come back, and my bishop goes, no, you're gone for a month. You know, stay where you're at, you're not coming back. I got so strong because I got away with God, and I, I just began to read the Word and be, be, say what the Word says about me, and man, I became so strong. But I just need a little relaxation and get away with God. There's nothing wrong with that, saints. I mean, even Jesus took time to get across the river, the river, excuse me, across the lake many times to give the people to get away. I know what my bishop told me back then. He said, if you don't take time to get apart, you're going to fall apart. That's like, wow. Now you tell me, where was you five years ago? <laughs> you know? But these things that we learn while we're in ministry, and saints, each one of us here are in ministry. Each one of us. The devil don't like you, but I do. But remember, we have an enemy that's trying to fight us. See, when you're physically tired and you're fatigued and you're mentally drained and physically exhausted, you're prone for depression. The thing I like about this, God dealt so tenderly with Elijah. He didn't come up and say, you bonehead like, you know, brother here Sunday morning, you know, Randy, you know. You bonehead, what's wrong with you? Get back on your feet. No, he was tender with him. God is tender with the saints. He is merciful. He is graceful. He understands. He says, come on, I want to take, 
just come along with me. Let's get in the secret place. Let's just see God. Like the brother told me, when he feels that way, he just runs to the altar. Say, God, I need your help. I need your help. I said, Lord, that's the answer. Just finding that peace. Number two, don't suppress your frustrations, but tell them to God. That's what Elijah did. He didn't suppress. God asked him, what's your problem? What's your problem? Well, like God didn't know, but God wanted to hear from him because, see, the beginning of revealing what's inside is the beginning of healing. When you begin to untangle those things and share those things with God, God already knows, but he wants you to begin to get them out. They begin to voice them, begin to, begin to get them things untangled in your life. He goes here in verses 9 through 10, he says this, Then Elijah went into a cave, and he spent the night there, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Kind of like Pastor was talking a little bit ago here about hide and go seek, you know. What are you doing? What are you doing in here, Elijah? He replied, I've been zealous for the Lord God Almighty, he says. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down the altars, and put all your prophets to death by the sword. And God's going like, duh. I didn't know that. Well, thanks for letting me know that because I, thanks for updating me here. But I'm on my way. I'm, I'm, I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. God goes, okay. So you got all the facts? No, you're basing on what you think is going on here. He just poured out all of his inner feelings to God. And God let him get the steam off. Let's get it out of your system, son. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. God is not shocked, saints. He knows you better than you know yourself. When you're uptight, let me hear the inner emotions. Say, I'm ready to know, I really want to help you out, but you got to let me know what's going on. you got to tell me. And God's just waiting for you. God's waiting for you to take the first step. I've learned that if we take the first step, God will take the next two. But he's waiting on you. He's waiting on me. Number three, get a fresh awareness of God's awareness in your life. Oh, God's presence is here tonight, saints. I was so overly joyed when I knew I had a preach and I'm going like, Lord, you're here. I mean, I love, he's always here, saints, with us. But there's times that his presence is supernaturally here. And I can feel it tonight. I'm going like, Lord, you did this for me. I know you did, Lord, because I need your presence tonight. Because I can't do this without you, Lord. In verses 11 through 13, it says, The Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, and for the Lord is about to pass by. Then the great and powerful wind tore by the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but, um, but the Lord was not in the earthquake either. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now let's pause right there, saints. I read that, I'm going like, dear Jesus. It happened in my life, that would definitely bring depression. <laughs> you know, you ever had an earthquake, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, Lord, not a physical earthquake, when your world gets shaken, and I say, oh my word, no, this just happened, and this is. Guys, I'm not any of those things, but listen here. Look at he put here, he says that, and after the fire came a gentle whisper, and when Elijah heard it, he put his cloak over his face. He knew it was the Lord. And he went out, and he stood at the mouth of the cave. God said, Elijah, I got something for you to see. I'm with you. I'm still with you. I've not left you. I'm not forsaken you. See, it was God showing his tremendous power as a reminder to Elijah. And the interesting thing here is it says that God wasn't speaking to Elijah in any of those things. What really got Elijah's attention was a still, small voice. Think about it, saints. When you hear God's voice, when you're in a situation like that, and the word of God comes from the pulpit or maybe from uh, in the worship time, God speaks that still, small voice. It brings life. I hear my father's voice. Thank you, Lord. I needed that. Or somebody calls you out and pastor or somebody says, I have a word from God for me. Just at the right time. Oh, Lord, that still small voice can bring everything back into order just like that. But one thing I found is God usually speaks to us when we're still and quiet. We quiet ourselves down and just get still before him. God will speak. Number four, last but not least, but let God give you a new purpose and a new direction for your life. Write that down. Let God give you a new purpose and a new direction for your life. That's what God did for Elijah. In verse 15, the Lord came to Elijah and said, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, here's what I want you to do. In other words, get back in the saddle again. Let's get going again, okay? Let's try to get back to moving again. You've been rusted. He said, I want you to anoint this king and this king and this king. He gave me him assignment to do. He says, try to get back up. Try to get, you know, saints, we all fall down from time to time. That does not mean it's the end, saints. 
we get back up again, we get back up again, we get back up again. Thank God that we make one mistake and God's saying, well, pfft, you blew it. No, our God's not that way. Our God's a God of second chances. He knows. Even like I said before, he can use all those situations to bring glory to his name. Yeah. Amen. 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 Wow, what an what a awesome set of uh, students we have here tonight. I did not really hear anybody. That's very good. That's awesome. And also, you want to know why I see why you fall asleep tonight either. Good job, adults. Amen. No, but seriously, on a serious note, if you're dealing with depression, don't, don't, don't sit on it. Come see one of the ministers. Talk to God, but you, gotta, you can get set free. Just take these sheets and say, Lord, I've got some steps that I can take now. Lord, I want to take this, because this is spiritual warfare. The devil wants you to be defeated. He wants to take you out. Don't give him any, any room. I know that's easier said than done because we all like a pity party for ourselves once in a while. But you know what, saints? It ain't worth it. It drains you. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. This next Sunday, we have an opportunity to honor in, uh, our pastors, Pastor Diane and, and Pastor Rick. And once again, I just thank the opportunity, even the times that I've been up here and I've fluffed. <laughs> These people like, are like God. They give second chances, third chances, you know. It's been nothing serious, but for me, once again, like Elijah, I take the little things and I make them bigger than they really are. But I thank God for this, this family that, uh, and I thank God for you that you've accepted me and my family. We have felt like family here from day one. And uh, it's no greater joy, but next Sunday we have an opportunity to bless them with a, a financial blessing, with a card, a letter. I have all my letters that were written to me. All, I got boxes of cards that I still pull out through the years and looking back through them when I'm just like, I've looked at them lately because everything's going, going good, you know, hey. You know, but to see what, the, what people have written, and I tell you there's no greater joy to get those. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Pastor, is there anything else? Yes. Oh, he wants to do something. Yes, you do, Pastor. All right. And we'll dismiss in just a moment. Uh, I want to... Uh, I believe we, need, we should have an opportunity to respond to the word. Go ahead and have us. Well, no, I'm going to have you stand up here, Brother Jonathan. If you'll stand up here, Leanne, if you'll come up here, Diane, Steve, come up here, Gary, and Lori, come up here. And uh, I believe that we should have an opportunity to respond to the word. And one of the things that I really sensed in my spirit was to have this team up here. And you can, if you're dealing with depression or any of the things that, that Brother Rick talked about tonight, we want to pray for you. And so I don't want to necessarily be in, in a great big hurry on this. I want us to take an opportunity to do this. So Miyagi, where are you at? You come to the piano, please? I forgot about that. Miyagi, can you come to the piano? Yeah, thank you. Come on up to the piano and play some music. And uh, if you're dealing with any of these things, uh, go ahead and let's get ready. Come on up and let's, let, us, let us pray with you tonight.